But all right. Hello. What's going on? Hello. So we're a minute early. You're the singer. I'm not the singer. Yeah. I really can't sing, but you never sing. I, my voice is shot. I got to start. From all your... Because you were a heavy metal singer. No, I, I sang actually you... with really good technique. I was... I was uh, heavy metal trained. singers don't sing with good techniques? No, no, some do. Um, but I was taught by... Uh, his name was Don Lawrence. He taught Sebastian Bach, Ray West. Um, who else did he work with? Phoebe Snow. A lot of, a lot of great... And that taught you how to sing but would you say your style of singing when you were a singer was i was like hair nation like hair nation yeah. wasn't I was, that kind of like so 80s heavy metal 80s 90s uh the well i mean the, led zeppelin -y. The, yeah the the best comparison you ever shared with me recently is, oh yeah you uh, sound like miles that one kennedy guy. from alter bridge you sound so like i was that a guy. tenor yeah that's so. exactly how you sound yeah in fact which is you... a huge compliment because he's probably one of the best you singers. think that because you sound like No, him. no, I'm not going to think <laughs> that. Sing for us now, Michael. So He sounds like the guy from Alter Bridge. Yeah, so That's exactly how Look he up sings. Miles Kennedy from Alter Bridge and you guys will see what a uh see what Doug amazing... sounds like. When you well, play that song, play when you play that before I knew, I would say, "Oh, is is that your record? Like are yeah. you playing your record?" Because the music was a, is a little similar too. It so, is. Yeah. You sound like Alter Bridge. Mm. Hello everybody. Yeah. We're not going to Now, guess who I do see today? Who? Michael. Uh no, yeah. And look, and Emily too. I She's coming. See. She's coming. She booked her flight and everything. Oh We're my so gosh, you're to coming you. to Success Revolution. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so excited. So is Michael. Awesome sauce. We are gonna have a great time. We're gonna have a great time. So we're gonna get right down to it, talk about emotional master today. Doug, you have a new program called Awaken the Force. Which first of all, can I can we just talk about that title? Because that is the best title in the world. And not just because you came up with it. It's true. Not because I came up with it. One of my skill sets is taking what people do and then putting it in a package and like mm -hmm. saying, what is it that you really do? Awakening the force through strategic emotional mastery. I mean. To create your rock star legacy. You're welcome. It's so cool, right? right? So we're going to talk today. Hey, Sue. We're going to talk today about how to. A little bit of awakening the force, mm -hmm. but we're gonna. This cat's gonna. It's gonna be driving me bananas. We're gonna talk about how to master emotions, what emotions we need to master, why it's so important to master our emotions, and what happens when you don't. Mm. So I'm gonna ask you some questions. Okay. And, and P.S. Uh, Heidi asked me, uh, "Do I want to know the questions?" And we decided no. I mean, that's risky. That's mm -hmm. like rushing really lot. <laughs> okay. The first question is. What's why is this so important to you to to be an emotional mastery guy? What two emotions were really you experiencing on a regular basis in your past mm. that were killing you? Okay. What were your Agreed. two go to negative emotions? Well, first Answer of all, that first, no, 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 no. First, why is it so important to master emotions? Right. And you give a really good the, the car analogy, which I think would be really helpful for people to okay. understand. Yeah. Well, why the the, the the first yeah. thing is ultimately life is emotion, right? If you think about it, anything and everything we do in life, we do really to experience or avoid an, uh, some sort of state or states. So when you think of it just pragmatically, you just look kind of high level, you go, if time is emotion, if life is just a series of emotions, like the state of your life is collective states of your life, then it's not your life, it's how you feel in your life. Right, yeah, yeah it's yeah. just, it's all the collective right. states. It's all those different experiences. And through all our experience with working in, in treatment with people who struggle with addiction, that's really all it was as well. It's just a strategy to change yeah. your state, to manage your state. And so some type forth. of way, feel some type of right. way. So when you really look at then anything that we do, any actions that we take, any beliefs that we hold, any meanings that we assign anything, it's all done from or whatever state we're in at that time. So as you use the example um, of the car, a great analogy I like to use, so if you're watching this right now or sharing it right now, um, what would be your favorite gas-powered vehicle like if you could have any gas-powered car in the world what would it be and <laughs> i really want one of those little mg convertibles which is a shit car or a porsche 911 carrera with the fin uh-huh okay that porsche great that now, red porsche like driving through the windy roads of california i, I yeah. know you know where this is going i know 
But that's why I won't say MG because that's no, no, no. Well, I know, but also we we got you a diesel so that you couldn't put crap gas in the car. You did. Anyway. Yeah. You did. Yeah. Because so I'm the person that won't. This is why this is so important. Yes, guys. this is so important. Okay, so check this out. This because you you, you, you 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 pigeonholed me, so I didn't have a choice. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I I ensured that she would run the best states for her vehicle. So. The Porsche 911. So imagine, would everyone agree? So let's get some likes. If you if, if you would love like a Porsche 911, Sweet let's guys. let's see some loves. Leave some or likes. Let's say Cage or not or an Aston Martin or Maserati or any of those cars. It's uh you know, imagine that. Now, given a choice, you have gas, right? You need to fuel up. Would you stop at Steve's Bait and Tackle uh, thrift store? <laughs> Can I tell and... you that in West Virginia, those are the choices. No, no, the, I've okay, seen, no, I, saw, I, I saw you <laughs> also have, no, but you also <laughs> had the choice. You can of, buy worms, get gas, the, and get some um, Swedish fish in a bag. Right, but they also had the <laughs> sheets or whatever that had real that's gas right. too. Sheets as well. Okay, so let's imagine you have the choice, put like, stop at Steve's Bait and Tackle, thrift store, and food truck, and put <laughs> 84 octane that's been sitting for five years, the bottom of the barrel, dredge that all up. Would you put that in your Porsche 911 or no. would you go a little bit out of your way to put the high test, clean, burning fuel? Yes. Yes. So I'm going to hallucinate that many of you would agree that. Because if the you can afford the in, Porsche, surely you can afford the gas. You'd think. Right. Not everyone does not that. Not about affording them. No, this is a, this is a metaphor as affording. well. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So what would that's, happen? Ah, oh, that's a good, yes. Go on. Is it just clicking now? No, 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 of course not. Because the objection a lot of people have is, I don't want to make the investment because I really can't afford it. But you, when your car breaks, you can't afford not to. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah Go hello. on with your bad stuff. So, I'm smelling what, what you're would happen in. if you put the crap gas in your supercar? That thing would bite would, the dust. It would not run Another very well. It wouldn't be effective. Right. It could also... Now, by the way, check this out. This is why this is so important as well. Because it goes beyond just putting that direct fuel in. If you're the kind of person who would not put the high test in, you may also be the kind of person who doesn't change their oil on time. Doesn't exercise. Doesn't, right, doesn't exercise, doesn't eat well, doesn't do all of these other things. Because how you do anything is how you do everything. everything. It's true. I was putting the crap gas in my car. But go on. And and I twitch a little bit every time I knew that. So Yeah, I yeah. But I also was, I was putting the gas as the metaphor for your emotions. Exactly. And you're running on, you're fueling up on resentment, anger, boredom, bitterness. Which would be the same as putting crap, crap gas, gas in your supercar. And I used to and do that. Get good results. I would put the crap gas in my car. I do one thing is I do everything. Put the crap gas in my car and then I would run on empty mm -hmm. in my own life. I ran on empty. You know, wouldn't take the time out to fuel me up, to, to recharge my batteries, to do the things. And just and wonder why I was running like shit. Why I personally was running like shit all the time. So... Just such a great analogy. So what Hello, kind of Miss fuel, Love? What kind of fuel have you been putting in? Hey Miguel, what kind of fuel have you been putting in your car? Because here's the thing. Every decision that we make, we make from whatever emotional state we're in at that time. Mm -hmm. So when you and I are angry, what kind of like Well, this is what I want to go personally with you now. Okay. Great. So what now in your own life, like it's one thing to be like, you know, we should really to manage our emotions. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to go shit, I need to manage my emotions because right. if I don't, I'm, I'm going to kill myself or die. What were the two two emotions that you ran on that were crap fuel for your life that you realized I've got to make a change? Great. So also, I'll answer that. I just want to also kind of share that most, most of us have a pretty small range of emotions that Facts. we stay in between Facts. five and eight. Mm -hmm. Women generally skew a little bit higher, men a little bit lower, mm -hmm. but that on its gross generalization, it's just a, one of those things. Mm -hmm. um, so we usually have just a few that we're running constantly. Mm -hmm. And then oftentimes we fall into that crazy eight pattern where we're just running one into another. Mm -hmm. So mine uh, growing up, I was either pissed off mm -hmm. or depressed. Mm -hmm. And how'd that show up? I didn't, I, I always loved people. So I never fought people, but I broke stuff. So mm -hmm. what I would do is literally every door, every wall in the house that I grew up in had patches or had been repaired, repaired or replaced. And then I would go, I get really depressed. So, um, 
and I'd be pissed off that I got depressed and depressed that I got pissed off. So my swan song, the song that I would just brood over would be Metallica's Fade to Black. And I would just sit there and crank it and I'd be like, Urgh. Immerse yourself in your depression. It, yeah, you yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Give, it, give a soundtrack to the shit. Right. And then, <laughs> and then while in there, like, breaking stuff. Radiohead was my sound, oh, okay. depressed soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah. So if you guys, if you had some soundtracks or songs that kept you doing that. And or said, what hey, are the Jerry? two emotions? Yeah, what were your you two? Felt? So when did it get to the point, like, what did the, that cost you? When did it get to the point where you were like, I, I, well, can't, I got, I have to change, or this isn't going to work for me anymore? What so was I, the pinnacle? I, I don't know about any of you guys watching, and and um, I always felt like there was more, like I had more to offer, more to give, that there was something. I was just not living up to my true potential, mm -hmm. and of course, there was always people. I'm sure telling you guys to like, you know, you're worthy, you're good. Right? We never listen to that. It's when you're like, you're a dick. You're like, I know it, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I always felt like a misfit, like on the island of misfit toys and my friends. And I remember uh, one night I was walking home and because I my friends blew, blew me off, basically. I don't mm, know what jerks. happened. Yeah. And um, I just remember driving back and well, driving back, walking back from now, of course, I don't condone this behavior but we were you know 16 years old hanging out in you know a bar that let people in so i wasn't feeling you know too great i was probably in drunk. an altered you state. were drunk okay i was drunk you were drunk so i was walking home pissed off depressed because my friends bailed on me or whatever and so as i was walking along there was a, a gate like a, an iron gate that mm -hmm. was onto old country road, you know, where we go to the bagel boss right there, all those fences. So I, uh, I was walking along and I ripped the gate off the, the people's house. And as I was walking along, then I got pissed. Then I took a knife and I slit my wrist oh. and there's the scar right there. It's pretty deep. Um, and I just started, you know, bleeding Bleed all over. And, and then I'm like, carrying the game. Fuck that shit. Oh my you know, God, like, that's like, that's like, it was weird. That's really intense. Yeah. So wow, bleeding all over yourself, carrying a iron Jesus. A gate, the irony. I I, I was carrying, was carrying the gate uh, of hell. <laughs> yeah, You're carrying around like your a, own prison. Yeah. That yeah. You're, oh my God! You ripped off a door to make a self-imposed prison. It's, slit yeah, your yeah. wrist, and we're walking around. Jesus, you can't make that up into a movie. No, I that's guess pretty not. crazy. I've actually never, told, never told that me story. That story. You know? I've never oh told anybody God. that story. Wow. It's not God. one of my prouder moments. Duck. That's bananas. Um, yeah. Wow. So that among other, so that's pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. So quite honestly, what happened was, um, and you, I mean, it got worse after that. It <laughs> did. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it didn't get any better. It didn't, no, but I knew, but again, I'm sure like, like you, that you, there was a part of me that was like, this is, this is insane. This is stupid. Yeah, I'm sure. not, you know, like I, this isn't, I'm not living to my my spiritual highest calling i'm, right. I'm actually being a, a I'm, I'm dishonoring my creator um then uh later that summer i think it was or maybe it was the following year i was still kind of dark and and all of that um constantly sort of made fun of i i was kicked out of every school i was called a dirt bag and a, we were the stoners the metalheads and even in that group of people whom uh, I'm blessed enough to, to still be in touch with many of them. I'm going back actually to a high school reunion in a couple of months. Hope you're not watching, or maybe you are. We'll have some amends. But um, I'm, I'm sorry if I was a dick. Um, but then a friend of mine who I definitely were still great friends, he and I got into a, a big argument. And um, so then he and I were in it. It were, doesn't matter. He was upset we we're both upset and I, then I, I was like ah, fuck you and I ran and I punched a window of a neighbor's yeah. house and then the glass came down and then there's that scar from I mean, that and, and then that, you have it, oh, like blood like streaming Don't. out like that it was crazy yeah. all I was wearing was pants that was it of just course. pants no Angsty. shirt no shoes Angsty, no shirt <laughs> right so it's like blood everywhere I told I told my friend God. and I'm like look what you did to me yes. and he yeah which he did right yeah victim mentality so uh so I started walking home and uh wow. as we we're walking home they went and got a car to take me to the hospital 
-hmm. So I'm sitting in the back seat in Matt's, his friend, my friend Matt, I won't leave your last name if you want, if you're ever watching this, you can admit to it. Uh, 1972 Mustang Fastback, taking me to the hospital. We were driving too fast, hit a parked car, a tree and two parked cars all over the place. So I got blood all over them, all over their car. And then I'm running around like a maniac. Now, some guy takes his hot coffee because it was his house, I think, and then threw it on me. He was like, yeah, fuck you. Right? Right? So nice. then the, I don't know why I'm telling you all this, just could make it entertaining, I guess, but it's true. So then the ambulance came. Yeah. My friend Joe, who he and I were the ones who were having the argument, he lost his front teeth in the accident. So I'm seeing his mouth is like all is like all jacked up. I'm running around like a maniac. The ambulance comes and the and the, the cops like get in the car and I'm like not until he gets in first. Get into the ambulance, and uh, they were like, all right, you're sending it away. And there was some concert going on in, in, at the Nassau Coliseum, so someone got stabbed there. So they sent off the ambulance. So then I'm like, fuck you. I'm going to drive him myself. So you're like, good, get out of here. So there was a party down the block. Someone gave me a ride to my house. I picked up my 1970 primer gray Mustang convertible, pulled up to the scene, and uh, I threw my car into park to... You're like an 80s movie. Yeah, and then like it fell. I got out to go get them. I, I, it fell into reverse and started driving oh. down the road. So then I'm like, you know, running after it. And long story short, I got arrested. I almost died in the in the cop car at that because point. Because you're bleeding out at this point. Yeah, time. yeah. Oh, yeah. When they took me out. I can't even. I, I just remember I was like peeing on myself because the blood was just pouring all over listen, me. Listen, listen, listen. I can't. And, uh, I can't. So when the cop took me out of the car when the ambulance came again, uh, I passed out. And oh, my God. Honey. Yeah, it was bad. So that was kind of like my. Wow. My. Uh, Kiss or tongue. <laughs> That's like my my worst moment. So that was a product of what my life had become. So yeah. getting out of jail wow. in the middle of Hempstead, wearing just pants and blood covered Maybe. all over me, um, I realized that I should probably change. And Get so a hold I, of yourself. Yeah. So that yeah. long winded story was to share with you, just kind of where I got to, and um, I came home another night, not right, you know, because of course that wasn't enough to stop me. No, yeah, thanks, Hope. I I, uh, I, I don't think I like sharing that either. But um, I love when you share stuff because I think it's great. I mean, of course, you know I'm how the, I am. I know. I'm so so I digress. So I came home one night again, not feeling good, in some sort of altered state, and I said to my mom, I was like, Ma. And at that time, Tony Robbins was on infomercials 24 hours a day. <laughs> Uh, so I, I just basically said, mom, give me the, the, you know, your credit card. And she's like, what for honey? I'm like, you're Tony Robbins. You're like the 30 days of personal power. I want that. <laughs> That's how you talk. That's how I talked back then. I was like, you're, 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 you're so angsty. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, my mom goes, oh honey, we have that already. Mm -hmm. And it was down in our den and I'm going to date myself. It was still shrink wrapped cassettes. Yes. So what was so interesting about that time in my life was that that was when I, I really started to make a paradigm shift in how I communicated to myself because what Tony was exposing me to at that time was the power of language, was the power of um, really of state management. And uh, that's why I started to really get into um, into NLP. And the, the, the challenge also, when we even have this conversation, here's what's so interesting about this conversation is language is such an incredibly powerful tool yet is extraordinary limiting as well because once we start putting stuff in boxes then whose box is it right mm -hmm. so that's i'm the, doing a thing about labels tomorrow right oh perfect yeah. right so exactly so here's the thing even check this out even my depression or you know rage or whatever is still subjective mm -hmm. right it's just based on you know me and and just because i feel that doesn't necessarily mean it's a true or B, that someone else can truly understand what that really is coming from. So rather than get into an argument about that, the validity, because everyone is entitled and, and certainly their, their experiences are valid, when you, when you look at it then from a higher level, you go, well, but how do I want to feel? Mm -hmm. Like just because something like just because someone called me a dirtbag doesn't necessarily mean that I am one. Now I may mm -hmm. have, you know, I bathed. You know, once a month, whether I need it or not. But 
like you know the, that game of of buying into those labels buying into whatever that experience the meaning that i gave that mm-hmm. experience like who like i to this day that night i don't even remember who was there right. or who abandoned it didn't me matter. Or it, it right. didn't matter because you found a way because you can be addicted to your emotions and oh, not know that you are. You are. And we get yep. addicted to our emotions and you were addicted because you couldn't feel any other way. You weren't going to have access to any other feelings. You decided the best you could allow yourself to feel as long as you were pissed or depressed. And a lot of men are in that same boat yep. where you're you're growing up. You're like talked out of your feelings, talked out of your emotions. Ah, don't be you know, don't be so weak. Don't be too sensitive. Don't be this. Don't be that. And like, there's places where it's okay for you to express yourself. One is through anger and the other is through sex. So you can talk about women all day and you can do whatever, or you can punch somebody in the face and you're a hero. But you know, the other things aren't, um, aren't, aren't, aren't acceptable. So it's learning how to access those other things, which we talk about all the right. time. What do you think has changed in your life? as a result of learning how to master your emotions? What are the benefits for you? Uh, game changing. So Chris, I'm gonna get to that and say, so he, he, he went to school, we grew up together. All right, and by the way, I'm gonna see you in uh, at the reunion. And yes, I'll answer that. Um, so what has happened? So what I was able to do was really transform my life in ways that was, that are immeasurable, right? So I was able to, well, essentially, in, in one night, I quit smoking crack, smoking cigarettes, smoking pot, and just kind of... So I can't even ever imagine you actually smoking crack, which is really funny because a lot of people, I mean, there's, you know, attorneys smoking crack. It's not a, It's not like a, it's an equal opportunity to destroy oh, yeah, yeah. But like, I just really can't even picture that. I, I was Isn't a mess. That's crazy. Yeah, I was a mess. Because your emotions got to that point where you're, you're, you're running these patterns and then you're just feeling like, I just want reprieve. Right. I want anything to numb it. And the crack wasn't the or, problem, although it's not a good thing to do. No, no. Uh, it was it, it made solution. me feel good. It, it was a solution I, I to the I felt like I was, anger. it gave me a confidence. Same thing with it gave pot, me empowerment. Same thing with pot, all yeah. the things that yeah, you were doing. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So what I was Yeah, it made to... you feel like not a, like when I used to do cocaine, it would make me feel like, you know, I was actually one of the, had the worth that I sought my whole life. It makes you right. feel like you're a superhero. Yeah. When you can, you don't know how to be a superhero in real life. No. Right? No, we don't. So then you have to learn. Right. And then actually the drugs are the kryptonite. Yeah, which you is don't irony. realize it. Yeah. Irony. I know. So, um, so what I was able to do is after really letting go of, of all of that and getting sort of some clarity of what I was passionate about again, which at that time was music, um, I completely represented myself to what really brought me joy, which was sharing experiences uh through music and did I, somebody make it okay for you to to like be as sensitive as you are at some point so that you didn't feel like you had you could be so was it tony robbins that experience where you learned like it's okay well, to be sensitive great? to have yeah you? i guess you're an empath number one well i you gotta say even though i energy. felt like a misfit amongst you know my my friends at that time i still you know to this day i'm still you know, amazing, like some of my best friends still. Right. And they were cool guys and, and always. It like, wasn't them. It was, no, it wasn't. Like so, I, but I, it was I knew us that. inside of our friendships. Right. I exactly. have some friends that get offended when I say, oh, my friends, my friends. But it's not about the friends. It's about. Right. It's about us inside of our friendships until we get our head on straight. Right. Fair enough. Some, for some people, it is their friends they need to. So, but, but what I did. So, yes, in, in this sense that what I found when I started really getting into like personal development and all that, what I was able to do is find a new tribe. Yeah. So find people that made it okay. Made like, it okay for you to try things on, experiment, jump up and down, act, you know, yes. get access with different types of ways of behaving and being. Cause I know a lot of time when people come to our events, like the one we're having in November, a lot of the people who come, that'll be their first time yeah. actually experiencing something like that. We're like, Oh my God, this is like okay to behave this way. It's okay. Yeah, why are we to, hugging the stranger? Why are we having access to all these different, you know, being encouraged? Because we're we're just like on autopilot, running mm-hmm. these same patterns over and over again. And it takes. I can I just interrupt you for a second when I'm on train of thought. When I first learned about NLP, neurolinguistic, <laughs> neurolinguistic programming. programming what did I say? Neurolingu- neurolinguistic. Whatever. When I first learned about it, I had such a bad taste in my mouth because I'm a girl who values authenticity. So I would say, because you know, your program is all about strategic emotional mastery through NLP, mm-hmm. right? So you're teaching people how to master it, yeah. their states. 
when I first heard about this, I was like, I don't want to learn somewhere where I'm going to have to force being happy or I'm gonna have to, you're going to have to make me jump up and down or you're going to have to like make me hug somebody. I, if I'm going to be out of my feelings, I want it to happen naturally, which is so freaking <laughs> hilarious because nothing about running the pattern of being depressed or anxious is natural. We think we're organically naturally depressed or anxious, but a lot of the, the time opposite. it's the conditioning, it's the pattern. So once I got over that and I was like, oh, okay, I learned how to behave anxious and I trained myself into my depression. Well, I can, I need to train myself out of it. I need to try on new feelings. And at first, when somebody's telling you to smile, when you're not feeling like smiling or jump up and down to change your physiology or your energy, you get really, you know, I, I got offended. because so I was like, I'll jump when I authentically feel like jumping. But I'm going to tell you something, until you jump, you won't feel like authentically jumping. And that's the irony. That's the rub. It's like the, the, there, there is no motivation. You have to do it and create the momentum right. instead. And so well, and I've learned how to retrain myself into authentic happiness. And that's the other now thing. Now it's is totally authentic. The, the truth to, is, is that we do get actually physiologically and neurobiologically addicted to the states. The states. Of anx mind uh, where anxiety and depression. Yeah. Or anxiety and lack. So then your body, all depression. of your all of your neurology kind of expects that and runs that pattern. Yeah, when you don't have it, you, you go into withdrawal. Start breathing, start, yeah. you know, ring your start doing all the things that make you more anxious. Yep. I had a woman in a woman's group one time and she was like, I feel like shit. And I don't know why. I mean everything sucks. You know, and I'm like encouraging her. Huh? Ooh. I'm encouraging <laughs> her to, you know, change her first. Like we, when we learn your language, your physiology, or your focus is what we teach, and you specifically with your Awaken the Forest program, which is how to change these things in a in a real concrete way. I mean, of course, when you well, an ecological sustainable way ecological well. and sustainable, so that it becomes more like. You know, my go-to emotions now, one of them is gratitude. And I've really trained myself into gratitude because gratitude is the antidote for my other one, which was lack. Mm. Always feeling like that I'm not enough, it's not enough, there's not enough, and you're not enough. And then it puts us in this proving thing. Like, let me prove my value. You have to earn it. I have to earn it. And so now the antidote to that is gratitude. And really, you feel once you can learn how to call your emotions to you, the ones you want, you're not a victim anymore to your own mind. You're not a slave. You're not carrying around the proverbial gate of hell that you ripped off of that thing, bleeding and bloody going, why can't I just live? You know what I mean? Like when our natural, like John Hughes like, wished he would have written that. You know what I mean? Like that's <laughs> woo. That's that, big time. Yeah, I guess so. Right. I reach out. Crazy. So I, I and I, I do want to actually died. Did he? Uh, to, to Chris, um, yeah. so did our uh, childhood experience in Garden City have anything to do with how I was acting? So uh, yes and no. wouldn't matter where we lived. Um, the, there's like always, a misfit because there was a bunch of rich kids. Yeah. I mean, we were, were not. Not the rich kids. We, we, you know, our family struggled to get in there. We weren't legacy people. You know, most of my family moved out as soon as high school was over. Um, but there was... No different actually now because the exposure that I had and that we had growing up, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have all of that. So all we had was the exposure of the the people who had more and, and the ability to compare and, and all of that where, you know, we, we would shop at Marshall's and then, you know, the other families could shop at Bloomingdale's right in town. Yeah, you hear that, but I grew up on welfare and food stamps. Right. But my, I mean, you know. But the point is now. So it's all relative. Well, right. But I'm saying, but now. What happens is, is that with the internet, with Facebook, you can compare now, to yeah, now you just turn it on and you see someone taking their picture, you know, they're like, you know, 400 pounds, but like you look at that picture and they look like they're, you know, a buck 20, right? You know, that's why, that's why I take my pictures, all that. Yeah, we lived in a bubble, Chris, indeed. Right. So, but it shouldn't matter in that we still had whatever resources, whatever opportunities, whatever exposure we had, then the meanings that we gave it was exactly what we had available to us. I think, listen, there is tremendous value in understanding your childhood experiences, right? And, and like putting the dots together. And that, that's what I help people do is like connect all the dots. This is why you behave this way, like in a beautiful mind that all comes forward and mm -hmm. you're like a riddle that's solved. 
It doesn't matter though. It's irrelevant at the end of the day. Why you are why you are isn't necessarily as important as how to change and the tools you need in order to, because the story is a story. Mm -hmm. Cool story, bro. Right? Like well, at the we all have those stories. We all have those stories of well, struggle. The, other thing the real empowerment is go from victim to victor when you take control. Because a lot of people are waiting for the mother that they never had, the father, they, they pat them on the back. But you, there comes a point where you have to be the mother you never had. Mm -hmm. You have to be the father you never had. And it's time to mother yourself, father yourself. Put it in the past. There's value in it. But it's not really going to help you change. You know? No, and the, Actually, let's, let's the use the example of the... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good. good. Great, Chris. Um, that uh, like using the car analogy again, like let's imagine you're driving along, right? You're driving along. You've got to get from point A to point B and you got a flat. Okay. You get a flat tire. You got to get from point A to point B. What is the next logical step? Sit down and analyze what happened with the tire. Where did it happen? At what point should I have realized that the tire, whose responsibility is this anyway? My husband's supposed to check my tires. Or, or and then go, why, God? Why? Or just go, Always me. Always me. Or just go, shit. Where's the thing? Yeah. Wrench? Get on. Yeah, Wrench? Tire, tire iron. Tire iron. You just get you back out on the tires. road. You just get back on. You change a tire and you get back out on the road. Now, fact. In retrospect, could there be lessons to be learned? Potentially. Like sometimes the lesson is sometimes you just get a flat. Other times it might be something like, well, driving like an idiot. Driving like I, you know, I drove on the shoulder because I thought my time was more important than everyone else's, and so I just drove on the shoulder. But what happens when you drive on the shoulder? What's on the shoulder? All of the debris, right? Now I will tell you, I got. Uh, uh, I'm a good year right now. Excellent, Chris. Yeah, you you, you get that solved, right? Constantly trying to change. Yeah, okay. so, Jer Jeremy says he's he's constantly trying to change the things he doesn't like about himself, and. You know, I, I there's a time for that. You know, I always say there's two paths to self-love, which is really what we're trying to do at the end of the day, right? Self-acceptance and self-discipline. And the only way to really change the things that you want to change is the self-discipline. We can't like miraculously just wait to wake up one day and be transformed. We have to put action in. We have to work with somebody to help us unpack some of these things so we can move forward. And self-acceptance is what do you really need to accept about yourself? You know, it's like in that old serenity prayer, you know, the wisdom to know the difference, to change the things I can't accept the things I can't. How you so, too, Chris. you know, what, what is it? Some things we need to change and, 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 and that's what we can really help you do. If there are things about yourself that you know that you're in these states that are, making you miserable. You constantly run a pattern of being depressed. You constantly run a pattern of being anxious. You constantly run a pattern of being feeling alone or isolated or angry or, angry or any, victimized. One, any one of these things. There is a way out of that, but it's strategic emotional mastery. There's a process to learn. And Doug teaches inside of his program, Awaken the Force, that there's this triad of ways that you can learn how to, it's a st strategic emotional mastery is a strategy. It's something that you need to learn in order to do. If you're gonna organically wait to wake up one day and just feel better, it's not gonna well, happen just, without you. And that may be the it's not gonna happen that you've been running, waiting for it right. to happen. You have to take action. And you don't know what you don't know. So there, you know, we're, we're so used to wanting a quick fix, right? Put a bandit on a flesh wound, take a pill, you know, mask it. We're in an Instagram society. If it doesn't mm -hmm. look good, let me put a filter on and pretend it's better than it is. But if you get with my husband and you unpack it underneath the hood and learn how to do this, it doesn't matter what comes at you in life. We don't have a perfect life. We have shit all the time that comes uh, at us. Which all the is time, perfect. Which is wonderful because that's how you know you're alive, right? Yeah. But, and you need the, the dark with the light and they, they mutually rise and that's not that kind of a talk today, but what we know for sure is that when the dark comes, we don't stay in it. We don't marinate in it. We don't sit down and like, you know, ruminate over it and attach to it. We find ways to, to find the gratitude, find the states that we want to find. You know, mine is abundance. That's a state I always need because lack was one of my things. So if I'm in a state of gratitude and abundance, what's your go-to thing that you've trained yourself into to combat the, the um, gratitude. pissed and depressed gratitude? gratitude. Um, Gratitude. Yeah, I didn't share the story, but that's what pulled me out of the the last time I seriously 
uh, considered taking my life. Uh, that was what pulled me out was gratitude. Uh, yeah. it was because. And if you could do that in the minute, because you were sitting on the edge of your bed, mm -hmm. you had a gun, mm -hmm. you were ready to go, yeah. and you employed what you're teaching in that moment. That's the moment. If you can learn these skills and apply them from d such a dark place, then you know that it works. Yeah. Because it's easy to work the skills when your life's going great. It's easy. Yeah. It's not easy when you're sitting on the edge of your bed ready to kill yourself because you're like, my everything sucks and you're forgetting everything that you know. Hope, Hope says a lot of the time, the reason we don't change is we still hear the voices of people who hurt us in our heads. We end up deep down believing them if we don't still have the person in our lives. And here's the deal. A lot of people that I serve have had abusive situations, narcissistic parents, um, parents in the voice in their head, you're not good enough. But I, but I have to say, staying in that mentality, what I know for sure is that voice ended for most of us a long time ago and we picked up where they left off. We are the voice. It's nobody else. There is nobody else in your head but you. It's like we say, oh, my mother's yeah. in my head. Oh, my father's in my head. No, honey, you're in your head, acting as your mother, acting as your father, but nobody's in your head but you. And when you own that and you take 100% responsibility for that, you understand I can change what's in my head. I can. I can assume responsibility for that, and I can train myself into a new way of speaking to myself. I can be the mother I never had. Mm-hmm. And come with us on, uh, you know, on November. Maybe, maybe we'll do, we'll play with that a little bit because here's the thing: it's not your voice anyway. It's not even. It's like uh, you know, Janine Roth, who's like so amazing with her eating disorder mm -hmm. work in the world, has come up with this. Uh, she calls her voice in her head the crazy ant in the attic. Mm. And one of the things that you do with NLP is you give these voices personalities and names, you and that's part them, of the strategic part yeah. of the strategic strategy. The strategy behind the NLP is learning how to put those voices in their place and there's a method to the madness. And this, again, once you master the skill sets, you, this transforms every area of your life, not just your personal life, your relationship life. Obviously that's, that's what matters to me most, right? I, I value my relationships. That's why I do the work that I do. And um, but business and well, that's everything. everything. Cause if you think everything. about it, we're, we're all, we're all on this journey together. And the, when you heal, you heal the world, right? Yeah. And the, the challenge is, is that we all sometimes are expecting other people to, uh, oh, thanks, Nicole. Hey, Dr. Nicole. Hey, if you're in Florida and you want a chiropractic system of well-being, totally transform your health from top to bottom by one, by the best in South Florida, contact Dr. Rothman. Yeah. She's on here in the comments, okay? That, that place is right here in, in Boynton, and she is absolutely unbelievable, and nobody will take care of you like she will. Yeah, a star indeed. And uh, I said uh, you end up uh, repeating what the voices had told you. Yeah, yeah you end up because you you basically you train yourself. Let's get into you know a little bit of the under the hood a little bit. You're actually hypnotizing yourself. You're you're programming yourself to do those behaviors, mm -hmm. and you can certainly do something about that once you're aware. And awareness is key. And and that's really the this whole conversation ultimately is, is about awareness. is awareness self awareness. You yeah. can't change any of the behaviors if you don't know what they are and what they're costing you. And that's really step one. Yeah. So if you want to, you know, start to think about that between now and the next time we're together, feel free to leave it in the yeah. comments here, and so we can see like we're all working on the same things. Doug told you his was pissed and depressed. Mine was anxious and lack or sad or depressed as a result of mm -hmm. not feeling like enough, there's not enough. What are your two emotions that you want to recondition? You want to deprogram yourself out of? The first step is to, con is to join us on November 10th for our one day success revolution where you're going to learn about state management there. The second step would be to contact Doug about his new program that's called Awaken the Force. If you're and, like a Jedi or a Padawan. So or, there's, yeah, there, there is some, we, we love, uh, well, I'm, I'm more of a fan of Star Wars, but really the, the force is I'm a your fan connection. Of the force. Yeah, the force. The force is really, you know, if you're, you're looking at Tao, you're looking at the Holy Spirit, you're looking at whatever the force that is otherness the Holy Spirit, is. The force yeah, it's is all, the Tao. Yeah. The force is the Jedi force within. Mm -hmm. And that's that's amazing because what you're really great at is not just the surface stuff. Like you yeah. help people connect to their spiritual, you know, root down in it 
And because that's it. the only thing that prevents us from accessing that is us. Right, so we've exactly. got to first start managing our state, which is what prevents us from coming or in. allows us to open it. It's up. like when you when when um, when Yoda's teaching the Force. He's like, your ego's in the way. Mm -hmm. Like, you need to get your ego out of the way. You're you're preventing it. It's not that you have to attain it or work for it. It's that you have to remove the barriers you've built against it. And the patterns that you've been running are the barriers you've built against the force. Because so, it's, in your, it's in you. you right. So the work that. that we're doing is aligning with the patterns, how you've been running the patterns, get awareness of them so that you could ultimately let them go in the first place. But you first have to acknowledge that you're holding on to it. How do you before? know you're holding on to a pattern? You're still single and you want to have love in your life. Okay. You're, then you know you're running a pattern. You've plateaued at some part of your health, your relationship, your money. You're not making your, any money. You want to be in a business, but you can't make it go. Any, think about anything you want in your life and you're not getting there. The reason you're not is because of the pattern you're running. Yep. That That's how important this is. It's really the foundation for everything. It's basics. It's kindergarten. Let's go. We can't do anything basics, before you. And then we yeah. move on to graduate school. Right. So um, join us for Success Revolution, the one day event. And also reach out to Doug if you're interested in just going get started. Well, in the either program. us, if you you know you're here too, you could. Yeah, but this this strategic emotional mastery is your is your thing. No, great, right? but but and for me, great. Reach out if you want to learn how to love yourself. You know what I mean. If you want to get better in your relationships, and you all wanna... roads lead to Rome, right? The, all, the only ways you can draw a square because you know the experience of loving yourself is. Well, it's how you do anything. Yeah. Oh. Okay. But I have a very different approach. I know. And I like your approach. So I think, right. yeah. So it's great. Reach out to either one of us or just come to the event. You'll see us both at the same time. That's right. So we love you for who you are and who you aren't. And we will see you shortly. Any questions, please feel free to reach out. Bye. Take care. Adios.